This podcast is brought to you by the Creation Academy, an apologetics ministry designed to teach, train, and inspire others to become strong defenders of the Christian faith and biblical creation. Launching early 2019, the Academy offers video and audio training with downloadable course workbooks, expert interviews, and exclusive Q&A sessions with leading creation scientists and apologists, quarterly ebooks covering a wide variety of subject matter, and even a private Facebook community where you'll fellowship and interact with a like-minded community of believers. If you want to be notified when the Academy goes live, and even help us design the experience from the ground up, head on over to www.jointca.co today and sign up for the wait list. You'll get early access to the Facebook group for free as a thank you for joining. You're listening to The Creation Academy, a weekly podcast defending the truth of God's Word in biblical creation science. I'm your host, Steve Schramm. This week we are uh, continuing our series. This is part two. Stop shifting the goalposts. Stop shifting the goalposts. How creationists and evolutionists can have more productive conversations. That's really what this is all about. About and what it has to do with is um, is correctly defining words um, when we look at issues, uh, having a clear understanding of those issues ourselves uh, before uh, trying to advance our own views and our own opinions on them, and being clear to define what we mean from the outset when we use uh, certain words when we communicate uh, certain ideas, and uh, and that way we can kind of be on a level playing field. We can um, help others to see where we're coming from uh, on certain issues and maybe um, have a better chance at at, uh, at getting the message across, uh, so to speak. Uh, so we began last week dealing with this, and we opened up by looking at a debate, a recent debate that has, uh, that has taken place, and the debate was about the question of whether or not we should understand Genesis uh, 1 through 11 as uh, literal history, if that ought to be considered a literal um, creation account, or if it is uh, purely figurative, or if it is uh, to be understood as a wooden literal interpretation or what. And Um, What's interesting is it led quite naturally into uh, this subject matter of stop shifting the goalposts. And so what we are going to do today is move into part two of this discussion. Just as a quick review, of course, I mentioned the debate last time. And what we did is we started with that uh, debate and found that one of the key issues in the debate that we observed was the simple fact that the word literal went undefined. It went undefined. Um, The question uh, proposed in the debate was whether or not we should take Genesis 1 through 11 literally, but the word literal was never defined. And as a result, two things happened. The, um, Con or the uh, the uh, opposing view in the discussion tried to hold pro um, the one who affirmed uh, the, the the view. He tried to hold pro to a standard on the word literal that ultimately for young age creationists is a straw man. Um, but it's a standard that likely Khan doesn't hold to himself. In other words, he would never, uh, even if he uses some sort of figurative language um, within the context of of a, a literal event that happened. We use the example of a of a soccer team and his son playing a soccer game and him telling his buddy that um, his son's team absolutely destroyed the opposition or obliterated the opposition. And we saw that um, while. Uh, his buddy surely is going to recognize that he's talking about a real son 
a, a, a real game that actually took place uh, last week or whenever it was in context uh, with a real team, um, he realizes that when he inserted the word obliterated there, that um, his buddy does not take him to mean that uh, his son's soccer team pulled out AKs and went ballistic on the other team. That's not what he means at all. He simply means that they won the game by a wide margin. And the point there being that in this case, Khan most certainly was speaking in a literal context and meant to be taken in a literal context and yet was okay with inserting a figure of speech that um, was not uh, to be interpreted literally. And so therefore, if we're not willing to live up to that standard in our own conversations today, How are we going to place that kind of standard on God's word? And we shouldn't. That's the point I wanted to argue. Now, for pro, the problem was, without having defined exactly what the term was, that he was confused as to the nature of the the debate anyway. He came back saying that uh, he thought he was supposed to be given scientific evidence for a literal interpretation. He was not defending the literal interpretation um, of proper, all right? He was not defending um, the fact that it should have been a literal interpretation or that we should read Genesis 1 through 11 according to a literal interpretation. And so, in that spirit, um, what we have decided to do is look at some commonly misused and misunderstood words, especially as it relates to creationism, and... um, we began looking at that last week, and I started with the word literal. And that's the only one we got done, uh, because I did uh, make some introductory remarks, talked about the thrust of this ministry, and uh, and how really my passion is to help other young age creationists um, uh, communicate better, to communicate better. Really, that's what it was all about and that's what what this ministry is all about. We talk about science, we talk about philosophy, uh, we do talk about these issues. However, we also bring everything down to a practical level and really get to the nitty gritty of what it means to communicate these views and communicate these values. Uh, I don't want to get on a hobby horse here, but I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you, the amount of people who. I have personally seen, and and many of which I've personally talked to, who have been turned off of young age creationism simply because of the language or attitude of um, of many of its proponents. Now, I realize that that is not a good enough reason to dismiss the view. I realize that. Nevertheless, this is what they've done. And that tells me that we've got work to do. We've got work to do to be able to become better communicators of the creation story. And the gospel may be offensive to some, and we can't help that. But we can certainly do our best to season our speech with salt. Let your speech be always with grace. That's what the Apostle Paul said. Season with salt. That you may know how to answer every man. Every man gets an answer. It might be a little different answer, depending on the context, but every man deserves an answer when they ask for one. Uh, 1 Peter 3.15. So that's what we're doing. We're looking at this issue with that in mind. Now, I want to repeat the question that prompted this whole discussion. It was a question that appeared in one of the Facebook um, groups that I'm a member of, and I said this would be a great topic. This is something that must be discussed. I did, I, 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 I did bring it out last time, uh, as I began to preface this series. But I want to go ahead and read it again, since we're going to be mainly looking at some of these commonly misdefined words. And um, I'm hoping to get through them all today. But I've got 13 terms, and this is an important issue that I really, really want to, um give a proper and fair treatment to. Meaning, I don't want to just skip through this. So this may turn into a multiple, you know, I mean, three or four episode series. I don't know. Um, I'm not going to rush through it, though. I'm going to take my time and carefully explain everything that I want to explain here uh, because it's very, very important that we not just brush these issues to the side. This is 
possibly one of the biggest issues that young age creation has faced is how to accurately communicate our views. And not only that, but also how to accurately understand when other people advance and communicate their views. These are not, I'm, just, I'm not about to give you 13 terms here that, um, that creationists misuse necessarily. So many of them are uh, misused and misunderstood by creationists, but many of them are misused and misunderstood by evolutionists too. And the point here is that we're able to correct them of these things and we're able to um, at least get on a proper playing field. I'm okay if you want to use a certain definition of a term that may be different than how other people use it as long as in the conversation you're both using it the same way so that everybody understands what's going on. All right? So with that said, I'm going to take a moment here to go back to uh, the notes that we had for last week and, uh, and read that question. So the question uh, follows like this. One thing I have observed through reading creation literature and its critiques is the reoccurrence of the charge of falsehood and misrepresentation on both sides. For instance, in a debate between YouTube atheists Aran Ra and Kent Hovind, it was stated that Hovind was deliberately redefining scientific terms to accommodate the creationist worldview and therefore misleading people. One sure way to come across as uh, false to astute and or well-trained opponents of Christianity is to use words that you don't possess the correct definition of, but manage to convince some who are less astute uh, than you are. I'm referring primarily to scientific terminology, but this can refer to philosophical terms as well. Since the cultural redefining of terms is so prevalent today and the aversion towards biblical creation is so strong, how does the Christian make use of terms as points of contact in a debate so as to not appear as a word thief and engaging in what Schaefer called semantic mysticism? It seems yet again that the issue comes down to that of authority and the trustworthiness of its source. And I thought this was a very well articulated question, and um, uh, I just really admired his courage to step up and ask this question because it's such a big issue. And he asked it in a very good way that will allow us to launch into this with a little bit of context. There are philosophical and scientific terms that ultimately are subject to redefinition if someone doesn't like what the term means. And I'm sure there are tons of these, tons of these. We looked at one last week, and that was, of course, the word literal. And we talked about how I I propose that we um, look at things uh, in, in terms of the word natural or you know, that we use another kind of terminology, like that we interpret Genesis according to the author's intended meaning or or to the historical grammatical hermeneutic. These are these are positions that by very nature of of just saying those words, they invite further clarification. Or maybe I should say that they invite the need for further clarification. In other words, when you say the word literal, um, usually you're not going to take time to step out and define what you mean by that. Yet it's apparent that in this debate, um, one group of people tends to use the word literal in one way, and the other group of people tends to um, hold them to an interpretation uh, that is different from that. Um, so in order to get past that, I say we need to use different language. Um Perhaps you could say that it is unexpected language. It is language that will um, broaden the discussion uh, just in virtue of using it. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and jump into the first term that I have written down for today. And that term that I have for today is the word science. Science. Now, this, to me, is foundational in the origins 
debate. A lot of times there is a misunderstanding as to um, what the word science means. There is a misunderstanding as to the different types of science. And there is a huge confusion around whether or not science should involve the study of things um, that would allow a conclusion that is supernatural or extra natural. So first of all, let's get one thing quite clear. The word science itself simply means knowledge. The word science simply means knowledge. I believe it's in First or Second Timothy in the Bible where um, in the King James it is translated science, um, and the term is falsely so called. Science falsely so called. And really what it boils down to there, it carries the meaning of knowledge. An unbeliever will claim to have knowledge, but they falsely call it knowledge because it's ultimately not knowledge if it's not subject to Proverbs 1-7, which says, of course, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Colossians 2-3 says that all um, treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ Jesus. And so we have to understand that the word science simply means knowledge. Now, this is uncomfortable for some people because many want to attach baggage to the word science. They, they want to attach their ideas, their philosophical and methodological ideas about how the world works to the term science. And this is one of those things where they might say, well, I'm using science in this sense, right? And they, uh, but they're not going to define it that way unless you press them on that. So my recommendation is when starting to talk about this, somebody says, well, science um, says that evolution is a fact, well, there are numerous problems with that statement. It's, it's a logical fallacy. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's just not true. <laughs> uh, evolution is not a fact. A anyway, that, uh, that we'll talk about that later. All right, but um, many problems with that statement. But and the fact that science doesn't say things. It's an equivocation, um, um, or excuse me, not an equivocation, but a reification. Now, your problem here is this. Science itself, now they might have defined it to mean that, but that is not going to be obvious unless you press them on that. So I would start with the question, what do you mean by science? What do you mean by science? By the way, if I've accomplished what I aim to accomplish, you are going to hear me say a statement like that many, many, many times by the time this lesson or this series is over with. What do you mean by the word in question? You've got to get clear on this or you're never going to be able to move forward in these conversations, okay? So um, what do you mean by science? Okay, well, by science, I mean the scientific method. Okay, well, let me stop you right there, sir, because... Because the scientific method and science are two different things. Okay? So, now, um, what do you mean by the scientific method? All right? And by the way, he's probably completely unaware of the fact that the scientific method was developed by theists. Specifically by Christian and a few Muslim theists over the years helped to develop the scientific method because they realized it was based on promises found in the Word of God in places like uh, uh, Jeremiah. Um, oh, I, you know, I can't remember the exact reference. I want to say it's in chapter uh, 25. Um, and then Genesis 8 22, that's a good reference. Um, Colossians um, 1. Uh, oh, Hebrews 1 3, Colossians 1 17, I believe, are good verses for this. But it's uh, for the uniformity of nature, for understanding that nature is uniform and it will be upheld consistently 
by the hand of God. It was people who realized that, scientists who realized that, that helped to refine the scientific method because they realized they could iterate and get the, uh, some of the same results. If, 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 if a hypothesis was going to be testing true then, um, or likely, then it was going to have to produce similar results in, in similar conditions over and over again. But prior to a Christian understanding of the world, there was no good reason um, for that kind of a view. And that's why there was no developed scientific method by the um, Greco-Romans or even by the Hebrews because they weren't necessarily very philosophically minded. Um, And so uh, when somebody says that they're using the scientific method and they're using it to bolster naturalism, then it's worth pointing out to them that the scientific method is based on theism all right now back to the word science itself okay so you might say you know you you establish with them all right that science is um something different than the scientific method science just simply means knowledge now look you're in the conversation do you agree with that definition can you agree with that definition now if they say no then you simply say on okay on what basis do you have for accepting a different definition of science? What reasons can you give me for using a definition of science other than the word knowledge? Well, you work through those reasons, all right? I'm not going to give you any examples here, but you work through those reasons as they come up. It's likely that you're going to be able to to demystify them or to get around them. Um, but what if they say yes? Okay, yes, we can agree that... Um, we should use uh, the word uh, science as it means, as properly, uh, pop, um, excuse me, properly and popularly uh, defined as the word knowledge. What do you do then? All right, you continue the conversation and you hold them to that definition. You do not allow them, allow them off of that definition. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is during the course of the conversation, because they're so used to this kind of thing, they're going to start to use the word in accordance to the way that they want to use the word. And anytime that happens, be astute, be on the lookout for it and say, no, wait a minute. We came to the mutual agreement at the beginning of this discussion that we were going to use science as it related to what it actually means, which is the word Knowledge. You haven't provided a better definition. Uh, I can't find any reason to use a better definition than the one that's classically held. So we're going to stick to that definition. Now, if they want to talk about something else, that's fine. But don't call it science. Let's understand. And this, uh, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here, but the next word we're going to look at is the word evolution. And a lot of times people substitute the word evolution for science. It happens all the time. When somebody says something like, and there's more distinctions here, but when somebody says something like, um, if you believe in the, uh, you know, science that helps us to take astronauts to the moon, how come you believe that kind of science, but you don't believe the kind of science that similarly, uh, similarly says that, um, we evolved, man evolved from ape like ancestors, um, with apes. Okay. Two different kinds of of uh, uses of the word science, neither of which are the actual definition. Science simply means knowledge. When they use definitions like that, they're talking about something else. You need to get clear on that, okay? Now, I, I realize some of you are just going to say, well, this is just semantics. This is silly. No, this is not silly because in most all of these conversations, you wind up talking past each other if you don't get this right. So you can tune me out and you can turn me off, but I'm right about this. And I'm not trying to be arrogant, but I am right about this. We have very unproductive conversations as a result of the fact that we often speak a different language from the kind of person that we're talking to. And we need to get this Right. Now, let me give you a little bit more about the word science. And like I said, I mean, I'm, I'm look, I'm 24 minutes into this thing, and I've not even moved into my second sub point on my first word, okay? And I'm being serious about this. We will take it. We will go as long as it takes to get these words right, because this is an important issue. 
Now, there's often a confusion on the word science between methodological and philosophical naturalism. Methodological and philosophical naturalism. Now, I've seen arguments both ways on this. I have seen good arguments for... Um, for the view that these should be thought of as two separate things, okay? And if I were just to, to give you a little bit of a distinction here, um, methodological naturalism is the idea that in using um, or in, in, in using the scientific method to study the world, um, we don't come to supernatural conclusions, Philosophical naturalism is basically the philosophical undergirding behind that that says we don't use supernatural conclusions because there is no such thing as the supernatural. So I have seen arguments from some who want to separate those things and say that, yes, it is valid to say that we should just use methodological naturalism. However, we should not philosophically rule out other explanations. Um, and then I have seen those who combine the two and say, look, these are essentially the same thing. Um, it's just one kind of describes the undergirding to it, and the other is the uh, practical outworking of the view. And to be honest, I tend to, convu- to, to, um, uh, to agree with that. Now, here's what I mean. It's, it's obvious that we don't um, directly study the supernatural. Now, I hope you understand what I'm saying there. I'm not saying that we can't come to supernatural conclusions. I'm simply saying that we cannot directly study the supernatural. Now, we want to be careful here um, from a credibility standpoint as well, uh, because I think it's quite intuitively obvious to almost everyone that we can't study the supernatural. But I don't know that we want to call that methodological naturalism because ultimately methodological naturalism also does say that we cannot come to supernatural conclusions. It adds that to it. It adds that one little caveat to the mix. You see, I believe we can study the natural world and come to supernatural conclusions. So that's a different thing. That's not methodological naturalism. I don't necessarily know what you want to call that. I don't know that it's it's called anything. Um, But to me, it's not methodological nor philosophical naturalism. These are worldviews that you are importing in over top of a definition of science when they're being used that way. And so here's the point I'm trying to make. A lot of people, when they say science, they are importing the definitions of either uh, philosophical or methodological naturalism, um, or potentially both. When they say science, they think it automatically entails those two things. But that's not true. What science, as far as if it's being used in the sense of the scientific method, for example, it does include, it does allow room for supernatural conclusions. Now, you might have heard much differently than that. But let me tell you, I say that with very good authority. And why is that? Well, it's because of what I just mentioned, the scientific method. It was developed by none other than theists, and mostly Christian theists, guys like Isaac Newton and Francis Bacon, for example. Um, Even the philosopher Descartes had a lot to do with this. These guys were Christians, all right? Now, obviously, in developing the scientific method, they understood that science, in that sense, is the study of the natural world. But that did not stop them from coming to the conclusion that God exists. And I don't know about most of these guys, but I do know, by the way, that Isaac Newton was actually a young age creationist. So, 
what we need to do is understand that these words have been redefined and definitions are being imported in. All right. Now, this is one of those cases where um, it's usually the evolutionist who has redefined this word. And, all right. Now, um, most biblical Christians are are not guilty of of this. We are using the term in a different way than they are, but I don't think we're the ones who have done the redefining here, all right, in this particular case. All right, now there is, uh, so, so let's stop with that. Let's understand that, first of all, that there is confusion. When many people say science, they actually mean the scientific method. And when they mean the scientific method, even while saying science, what they actually mean is the scientific method according to methodological and philosophical naturalism, which rules out supernatural conclusions. So there's, it's kind of like a three-layer cake, all right, happening right here. They say the word science, but they've imported at least two or three other ideas into the mix, which are foreign to the term science and actually just simply means knowledge, all right? So think about that when you're, and this is as basic as it gets. I mean, science is one of the most basic terms. That's why I started with it. Um, and already we've got uh, an extreme confusion happening here. So don't get tripped up by that, all right? Now, the second thing about the word science is um, this confusion with uh, operational, forensic, and origin science. Operational or observational, it's also been called forensic or historical, and then origin science. Now, you... in. And you interpret, um, I want to be careful how I, how I word this. You interpret different kinds of data according to different kinds of methods. I want to speak very intuitively obvious here because what evolutionists today want, want to say is that there is no distinction to be made. If you watched the Bill Nye and Ken Ham, um, Ken Ham uh, debate in 2014, Bill Nye brought this out. He said there is no such distinction. Now, they didn't talk about origin science necessarily there. Ken brought up the difference between observational science and historical or forensic science. Now, according to Bill Nye, there is no difference. Now, Ken Ham properly defined the word science as knowledge. I don't remember Bill Nye giving his definition, but here's the problem. When he says that there is no difference between these two things, between these different kinds of science, you've got two problems with that. Number one, he's, he's not properly defined what he means by the word science. And I guarantee you, he means the scientific method according to Guidelines set in place by philosophical and methodological naturalism. So there's that, all right? But then he's also, number two, um, simply uh, downplaying intuition. And what I mean by that is it seems intuitively obvious that whatever kind of science you do to understand how chemicals in the present react with one another is a different kind of science than, say, understanding how two chemicals came together to form life, a one-time event that happened in the past. It's a different kind of science um, that uh, takes astronauts to the moon than the kind that helps us to understand how life, um, quote, unquote, evolved. These are different kinds of things. Why? One of these things is in the past. One of these things is in the present. And so it's going to, there's going to be something a little different about the kind of science that is done. Think about a crime scene. It's going to be a different kind of 
method that allows you to solve a cold case murder investigation than an active murder investigation case that, say, you know, of a murder that just happened yesterday or two days ago. It's going to be a different kind of method. So this seems intuitively obvious, and I think that we should not dismiss our intuition here. All right, now I don't want to say too much more about this. I do want to move on and maybe try to get one more term in, at least. Although it's evolution, so it's probably going to take a few moments, but... um, I want to say that this distinction is not a creationist invention. Let me emphatically say that. Because almost always, I mean, I cannot tell you how many times this has been repeated. The charge is that creationists have made up this imaginary distinction. Can I read something to you? Ernst uh, Mayer who literally wrote the book on evolution. He wrote a book, a very, very popular book, especially as an introduction to evolutionary theory, called What Evolution Is. He wrote this book. This is what Meyer himself said um, in a lecture that he delivered in Stockholm at the Royal Swedish Academy of Science in um, September 1999, and this was published um, in 2009 in Scientific American. This is what he said. Quote, For example, Darwin introduced historicity into science. Evolutionary biology, in contrast with physics and chemistry, is a historical science. The evolutionist attempts to explain events and processes that have already taken place. Laws and experiments are inappropriate techniques for the explication of such events and processes. Instead, one constructs a historical narrative consisting of a tentative reconstruction of the particular scenario that led to the events one is trying to explain. This is Ernst Meyer. He lived from 1904 to 2005, and quite literally wrote the book on evolution uh, called What Evolution Is. Now, understand that this is from the horse's mouth. This is not, when, when, when creationists use these distinctions, this is not a creationist invention. It really is Not others before him have said this, but he's probably one of the most prominent names that most people are familiar with. So I think his quote here is is telling. It it works. It works in our favor to understand this. Um, This should uh, be something that is made clear to evolutionists. When when if if and when and and I've mentioned this before on the podcast that I don't typically even use this distinction. Um, I try to. and I'm not against using this distinction. I just do it in a different way. I, I typically make a distinction between science and philosophy. Because a lot of um, there's a lot of philosophy that undergirds science. And so you kind of have to um, understand at what point the jump is made from science to philosophy. And that's just the way that I prefer to, uh, prefer to uh, frame the conversation. Um But again, that's merely a matter of preference. I'm happy for somebody to make the distinction between operational and forensic science or observational and historic science or or just, I mean, however you want to say it. Um, Just understand that this is not a creationist invention. When somebody brings that up to you, tell them, look, no, this is not a creationist um, invention. You don't understand science, what science is. You're improperly defining science science. And I can show you. I can prove it to you. And the evidence that I just gave is how you prove it to them. So uh, a brief recap on that. You say, look, science actually means knowledge, number one. Number two, if if by science you mean the scientific method, Christian theists came up with the scientific method. Therefore, the scientific method, while it is a study of the natural world, is not to be done to the exclusion of, of potential supernatural 
explanation. Now, if you think that's what the scientific method is, then you have actually imported methodological and philosophical naturalism into it. And that's a whole different thing. Now, look, you might not even get to talk about the original thing you were going to talk about. He might have wanted to talk physics or evolution or something like that. But you can't even move past the definition of science because you're not clear on it. And he is not clear on it. And then you say, well, wait a minute now. Maybe you do advance in the discussion a little bit. And he starts asking you questions like, well, if you believe in this kind of science, why don't you believe when scientists say this, you're inconsistent. And you say, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. There are different kinds of sciences. And they say, well, no, you've made that distinction up. Ah, well, wait a minute. No, no, we haven't. This is Ernst Meyer who said that Darwin introduced historicity into science and that laws and experiments are inappropriate techniques for understanding such events and processes. You see how this works. You you don't let, if you know somebody is improperly defining a term, you don't let them have the term, especially without making it clear. If you give some, I mean, now, now let me back up a little bit here because we're talking about conversations here. We're talking about uh, conversational tactics ultimately. If you want to give somebody grounds to use a term for the sake of argument or for the sake of, of clarity, according to a different definition than usual, then I'm not against that. Um, and I don't know how to give you a full, I hadn't thought this out, so I don't, I don't know how to give you a fully well thought out example, but um, let's just say that you guys get real clear, you're in a conversation with a person and you get real clear on the actual definition of science and yet it's just easier for the person um, to say, uh, you know, natural science or naturalistic science or something like that um, as a as a proper term that would import the use of philosophical naturalism according to, uh, you know, uh, the scientific method interpreted according to philosophical naturalism, and now you're using some variation of the word science for that. Um, something like that. I'm okay with that, but everybody needs to be clear. I don't care what you call it. Um, one example I give is uh, there is a, um apologist I follow who often uses the words mind and brain interchangeably and what he means uh, by that and he's very big on defining terms what he means by that is an immaterial thinking thing <laughs> that's what he calls it an immaterial thinking thing and he's fine if you want to call it a mind he's fine if you want to call it a, a brain whatever you want to call it he just wants to be very clear and upfront about that going into um the conversation. And so um, that is one maybe good example of a way where you can you not give in, but you can, for the sake of argument, you can give somebody the use of a term, even if it's a little unconventional, for the sake of actually moving on the conversation, as long as everyone is clear about what things mean. Now, um, I'll tell you what we're going to do. I am uh, actually going to cut this episode right here. Cut this one right here. Um, we're actually 18 to uh, 20 minutes, somewhere in there, um, less, uh, uh, shorter, I guess you would say, um, than we normally do. We normally go between an hour to an hour and five minutes, something like that. Um, but um, yeah, I'm actually going to go ahead and cut it off. And here's the reason why. Uh, I've said all I needed to say about science, and um, the next term is evolution. And there is no way um, that I'll get through evolution in 15 minutes, um, nor do I want to. Again, I want to give this a proper treatment. And um, I can already see th this series is going to go a lot longer uh, than I had intended. So um, I hope you'll uh, hang out with me. Um, this is important. We want to get clear on the kinds of terminology that uh, that we're using. We want to be sure that we speak gracefully in these conversations. And we want to ultimately move people one step closer to Jesus. Give them the gospel get them saved, and uh, show them the truth. 
That's what we're attempting to do. And the only way we're going to do that is if we get clear on what we mean um, when we say certain things. And um, ultimately, it goes to our integrity. We want to hold them to a standard that is reasonable and hold ourselves to a high standard as well so we can have more productive spiritual conversations. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and want to say thank you for the ability to communicate one with another. Not only that, but thank you for the ability, God, to communicate with you. Um, through your um, uh, through your word, Lord, you communicate to us, Lord, and again, through your Holy Spirit as well. And we're thankful that even when we go through times of trouble and times of pain, Lord, there's times, Lord, that we can't even um, communicate to you how we feel about things. And so thank God for the Holy Spirit, which um, groans and, and utters things, Lord, to you, uh, Father, on our behalf, when we don't even have the words to say, oh, how thankful we are for that, Father. And we just want to ask now that in our conversations, in our going out and witnessing with people, that we would get clear on these things, that we would be able to to carefully articulate our position and use words according to their proper definitions and hold others to that standard as well. Lord, we cannot do this without you. We cannot live but in the power of your Spirit, Lord, and when we attempt to live without the power of your Spirit, uh, it always ends in utter destruction. We see that in so many biblical examples, and Father, we don't want to end up in that position. So I pray now that you would help us, you would bless us, you would keep us, you would you would help us to uh, become better defenders, Lord, of you and of your word. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, hey, thank you so much for joining me this week on the Creation Academy. Um, again, a little bit shorter episode this time. Ended up being shorter by, you know, 15, 20 minutes, something like that. Hopefully um, that'll be all right with you. And next week we will jump right back in and uh, we will start looking next week at the term evolution. Evolution. And uh, I'd like to try to get through um, uh, the next three terms on my list next week. Evolution, kind, and species. Those are the three words that uh, at least I would like to tackle those next week. Evolution, kind, and species uh, because they are so related and kind of have um, interconnections one to another. So that's what we will attempt to accomplish uh, next week. And I hope you have a great week. Thank you for joining us again on the Creation Academy. See you next time. Bye-bye.